thank you for tuning in to this episode of Amazing Outdoors. This podcast is being presented by Upland Outfitters, home of the relentless pants, man. Those things are awesome. I had them out this week, and I pretty much since I started the partnership with Jason, have been uh, wearing those pants out any time over the summer here where I had to do any work at the farm or dog training. We even had them on the boat a little bit. They are tough as nails. I have yet to see a poem thread. I've been in some nasty briars. They really held up a lot better than I thought. I can't recommend them enough. Hunting season is around the corner. Make sure you use discount code AMAZIN, and I believe Jason is still offering 20% off on the Relentless Pants. So pick up a pair before hunting season is upon us, and uh, you're out in the woods with a pair of ripped up pair of pants. And sweating, you know, unnecessarily because uh, Jason's pants and the Relentless Pants are are top-notch and breathable, light. So you're going to want them this early season. Make sure you get them now. I also have a quick announcement. We've got another kind of temporary partnership with Chippewa River Custom Rods. Uh, Tom is going to be offering... 10% 10% off with discount code AMAZIN10. AMAZIN10. And it's all caps. Um, if you decide to call him for a custom rod, just make sure you t- tell him that uh, you heard about custom rods on uh, Amazing Outdoors podcast. And uh, he will make sure that you get hooked up with the discount. All that information for both sponsors and partners are going to be in the show notes. So please support the podcast and uh, these uh, great companies they are really good partners for the podcast and i would like to see uh hope our lips listeners support them as well so look them up upland outfitters and chippewa river custom rods enjoy today's show On this podcast, you will hear about our adventures, chasing all kinds of different game here in the heartland of America. We live and breathe outdoors. We hunt, we fish, and we absolutely love being outside. It is not just a passion, it is a way of life. Welcome back, everyone. I'm very excited to have you back for the fourth episode. We sit down for a conversation with Mark Fouts of the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. We chat hunting last season, dogs, and a little bit about what's coming up next year for Mark and also what membership drives go to and the drive that they're currently having for their 60th year. Uh, nonprofit work and healthy forest work for all of us so we have a place to go and hunt gruff grouse and woodcock in the fall enjoy the conversation it's uh by far the best podcast we're bringing you to date so i look forward to bringing you more content like this enjoy the conversation with mark and i all right mark are you still there i'm still here all right Awesome. Well, I've got Mark from the Rough Grouse Society here. I'm I'm very, very excited. He's our really our first, I guess, professional industry guest. We've had a few guests, uh, friends and such that uh, shared their thoughts, but I'm very in- interested to get some of the information from Mark and, and get acquainted here. So, Mark, can you give us an introduction? Sure, Brian. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, my name is Mark Fouts. 
I'm the vice president of the regional development, Western Great Lakes region and Washington, Louisiana of the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society. Um, I've been with the group for over 22 years. And then I was a volunteer starting in 1991 as a committee person in our local chapter. So I've been around the organization for quite a long time. That's a, that's a quite a tenure. Um, I didn't know that. And, uh, <laughs> I, I did 10 years at a company and, and, uh, I had to get out. So you must really have a passion <laughs> for the project and everything you guys do. I do. It's, uh, it's one of those things that's, you know, I always look at it this way. It's not a, um, it's not a job if it's your passion or what you, you know, you believe in, you wake up in the morning and you want to do everything. And so it's a, uh, it's kind of one of those things, you know, I look at life as you're born into a family and then another family chooses you. So you get those two chances and luckily the rough grouse society or grouse and woodcock chose me. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to be where I'm at. That when you can mix that passion uh, in life with, with employment, um, you've kind of have the right recipe. I, I told you prior in our little introduction time on the phone here today that, you know, I left the corporate world after a while. And, and part of that was because we were, we did some good things financially and took care of the right things. But the other part was because I realized that I don't need to worry as much about retirement if I'm doing what I love every day. And, uh, I, you know, I'll be doing that till the day I die. So why worry That's too not, much about retirement other than taking care of your health and other things, and, <laughs> you know, you have to be responsible enough, but I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can look at things a little bit differently from an income perspective. Um, if you're doing something that you're passionate about and you're not too worried about when you're going to retire. Right. I think this, you know, this last, last year, last year and a half, I think a lot of people have kind kind of looked inside out and probably had that same perspective, you know, at trying to uh, reevaluate their life and priorities and, and realize what's important, not important. And probably a lot of material things probably went by the wayside and, and you find out what's really important is your family, your friends, your activities, you know, and, and some are, you know, their dogs. And so it's just, uh, you know, I, I think some of the people that have been sheltered, if, if they didn't have a pet, you know, uh, where would they be? And, you know, and, and obviously the pets bring a lot, a lot to a, a relationship. And, and I, I've been fortunate to have, you know, some pets along the way that uh, have kept my mind, uh, my mind busy. So I'm assuming they say. being a, being a uh, rough grouse in America, Woodcock society guy, I'm assuming you got a, you got a hunting dog, right? I do. <laughs> I, um, I was, I, I got my first hunting dog, uh, way back in the uh, 80s um, I got all the service and started hunting with my friends who had been hunting while I was in the service and back in Omaha Nebraska is where I'm from and, okay and they kind of got me hooked and it really got me hooked and it you know I've never been out of it since so I got my first hunting dog and I, I always say that I've had about every breed or every style of dog at one time or another and uh which I have, I have uh, pictures and AKC registration papers to probably prove that. But uh, I've settled on um, English pointers uh, probably 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. That's well, yeah. prominently what I've been with is with English pointers. You, you know, I've had, this, this conversation might go a little bit longer because it's a breed that I uh, am, am very, very much interested in learning more about. <laughs> yeah, there. Well, I, I, I have, you know, like I said, I've had a lot of, of dogs. I've had, you know, setters and Gordon setters and an Irish setter and, and a wire hitter. And let's see, what else have I had? Um, that's pointing dogs. And I've had labs and I've had a springer at one time, a long time ago. And then in the last, you know, 14 months, a little, I, I got, uh, also, I have some English cockers. Sure. So, so I have uh, English pointers. I got another English pointer coming here and coming up here pretty soon. And so I'll have English pointers and English cockers. So um, I, I guess I have the best of both worlds. I'm hoping we'll see. I, but, you, know, uh, you know, I know a few people who have ventured down the cocker spaniel um, uh, path recently and, um, uh, -huh. Um, 
they they enjoy it. Uh, I, I'm 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 very still new into the pointing dog world, so mm-hmm. I, I'm still tied very much to that. That I don't know that I could venture, you know. The, but the wife keeps bugging me for another house well, dog. So, <laughs> well, I, I I got in there. I got into an English cocker because uh, the breeding and the dog or the puppy that I was looking for wasn't happening, so it was being delayed and. I was putting a lot of stress on uh, a single dog at the time. Sure. And so I had to get a backup plan. And so I got a backup plan and she worked out really good. And then I said, well, she worked out good. Why not get another? And then meanwhile, I got another, then the pointer litter came through. So I had that. So, you know, I went from one dog to two and now I'll be up to four here pretty soon. Hey, so I, I'm you'll lucky be busy that, this fall. Well, I, I'm lucky that my wife is, uh, she um, is very understanding and uh, she lets she puts up a lot and the dogs are good citizens as they say sure and so that's why i'm able to have those dogs if they weren't good citizens i probably would probably be able to only have one so um so i, I take a lot of pride in my dogs and uh, i i really like them a lot and you know i always look at it this way brian you you go to a parking lot at a at a mall and you know you see how many different colors and brands of vehicles are in the parking lot but everybody drove something different but they got to the same location exactly same thing with dogs it's just you know what you want to drive and how you want to get there and uh so i'm very uh conscious i always say i like driving a cadillac that's why i have a pointer so (laughs) and i leave it at that because it offends a lot of people and you know, and some people drive, you know, uh, Humvees, and some people drive trucks, and some people drive Ford Pintos, and then run around the market. But I like a Cadillac, you know. They look good. Uh, they work well. And when you put them away, they still look good. So that's just that's just my point of view. Yeah, no, I, I, I just love the energy of, of, of I mean, I have two uh, German short-haired pointers. And, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I just kind of stumbled into them, my my daughter was the one who actually said, well, we need to get a dog. And I said, well, I'm not going to get a dog that's going to sit around the house and be lazy. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, uh, we, we kind of fell in love with the breed, but I I know people do get offended and I try not to say too much about other people's dogs. You know, I, I'm just uh, gracious. Usually when there's a different dog or dog breed that I get to see and hunt over, it's, it's always interesting. I seem to learn something. Right. Well, I mean, the misconception for, um, you know, English pointers are they're just, you know, they're kennel dogs and um, they're just, you know, independent. They're on their own. And, you know, the the line of English pointers that we, you know, I have or been part of, um, they're the best house dog I've ever had. They're the easiest dogs I've ever owned. I mean, I'm talking any dog. And they're that nice. They don't, they're not barkers. Uh, um, yeah, they're just incredible and, and and people say this is a pointer and i said yeah it's a pointer so but it also it's how you're you know how they're raised how they're socialized but i mean this dog that i have it, you know right now i think she's going to be seven i probably heard her bark five or six times in her life wow but but if you you know if you leave them outside in the kennel and all in at the moon i imagine that she would turn into a barker but sure, housewise sure. i mean right now i'm looking here i got I got two dog beds in my office. I got two little cockers on one and my pointer on the other. Just they've been sleeping here since lunchtime. So again, it's just how, how you know how you raise them. But you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about different breeds. And I used to tell everybody, a dog that hunts for you that doesn't ruin the hunt for me is a great dog. So exactly. whatever dog that you have is, I'm happy. You know, whatever you like, I'm happy. I mean, I. I I don't like to be, uh, I don't like anybody being a breed snob. It's not fair, you know? Oh, Just because absolutely. You, yeah. I mean, I look at it as if that dog's getting you out outside and getting your kids away from the video games, I love mm-hmm. it. Absolutely yeah. love it. You bet. You bet. So you, um, I think you're, you're in the Northern part of Minnesota, if I recall. Um, well, Northern Wisconsin. Northern Wisconsin. Okay. Northern Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So how was how was your? I mean, I'm just a random question. How was your fall last year? Did, did well, you, did I, I you thought the grouse season. Well, I, I thought the grouse was average. You know, when I say average, you know, some pockets were good, some days were good, some you know days were bad. Uh, early on, you know, the season, you know, you 
you have a lot of bird contacts, but you don't see the grouse. You know, it's you hear them. Part about early well, season. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and then there was a period of time where they seemed to disappear, and then late season seem they seem to uh, open back up. You know, maybe it's because they've been spread up. You know, as far as the, the family has been knocked around a little bit, and um, so I thought, you know, again it was average, but you know, I heard other areas and, you know, the Park Falls, Phillips, you know, Drummond, you know, um, all that area was a little bit better uh, than where we were, you know, where I hunt. Sure. And, you know, and I always call that, that's the, you know, Bermuda Triangle of the, of the great grouse hunting in Wisconsin. It is. But, uh, you know, the woodcock, you know, the woodcock season uh, was pretty good. There was, I caught it, you know, I caught the flight uh, one, I caught the flight. This was, the third time in my history of since 1988, I caught the flight and uh, it was really good. And, and with, you know, with flight birds and woodcock, it's, it's not about, you know, the birds or the harvesting, you know, it's, that's when you wish you had puppies and a whole yes. trailer full of puppies. Cause yes. then you can, you, you can, you can make it, I can make a dog in a weekend oh, or, or my, two days or three days. My, my youngest pointer, we hit it, uh, her, like, uh, it was la two seasons ago and she was, I think, Oh well, no, it was, no, it was two seasons ago. It was the first time I had her out in the woods. She was eight months old and we went up, uh, I think it was the first day of, of Woodcock. That was a weekday. So it was already, the weekend had already been hunted, but it was the first day we flew up just North of the cities uh, to another rough grouse society, Woodcock society place uh, for Brooks. It was, and yep. um, we went way back in there, and one of the cuts back in there was just absolutely loaded with flight birds. And I think we, she had, uh, if I could have shot, I would have shot my limit, but I stopped shooting because it was just, there were so many birds in there, and I couldn't mm -hmm. hit anything. I think we had 14 points on the first day. Mm -hmm. It was just, and it was just unbelievable. Um, it was, it, it was a, Time, it was a one outing I'll never forget with her, and it was and it was just the, the impact that made on her for that season was so. She came out of training, and we had that one day, and it, she just was has been a rock star ever since. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, it just they would spend. I can point to a couple days in her kind of career where it's made everything click, and yeah, those are very special days when you can get into all those birds. You bet. Yeah, I mean, don't feel bad. You know, the, uh, as I tell everybody, you know, the woodcock is the slowest bird that God made fly. It's the <laughs> slowest bird. But even though it appears to be fast in the dipsy doodles, it's the slowest migrating bird on record. So don't feel bad, you know. <laughs> That's wow. what I would tell you when they, when they miss birds. But part of the reason why I want a guide is because I can't <laughs> hit a damn thing. I need, I need people who, who can, can shoot. <laughs> well, the, the one thing I learned about taking people out, you know, a lot of uh, mentored hunts or first time people is there's never been a bird that I haven't hit when I didn't carry a gun. Just remember, you know, that's an easy, it's an easy thing, you know, yep. when you're taking people out. But yeah, I mean, when you, when you're able to get a dog and, and especially a young dog on there, I mean, there's many a times where I've been into an area where I've been fortunate to be, have some birds and I'll uh, walk back to the vehicle and get a training pistol and go back out there and just do some training, you know? Yep. And it's amazing how, how the steady and how everything changes for them, but it's just, just trying to get them, you know, get them in the zone, you know, on that. It, it, very, it's very fun. Oh, it's, 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 a, to me that seeing that light bulb turn on for the dog is, is, a, is one of the special things. And it's why I love having the bond with the hunting dog. It's, it's, um, to, you really see that. I mean, it doesn't matter what breed it is, but you see the dog learn and learn and learn and they mm -hmm. just get smarter and smarter. And, and at some point they, really i'll pass you <laughs> and they start well, teaching you things <laughs> well they you know i always say they, they have passed me when they were born it's just <laughs> it's just how how you are able to you know work as a team and and you know to get them to do what you want i mean they know what they're supposed to do it's just how how do you how do you morph that into what you want to do and and you know how do you hunt everybody hunts different i mean you've probably been around long enough where you see people that 
hunt with bells or people hunt with beepers and hunt, people hunt with GPSs and, you I've know, hunted and, with all three <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and, and there's different styles. Some people, you know, run and gun, you know, they walk into an area 20 minutes in 20 minutes out. Other people walk into an area and they'll hunt it for two, three hours, you know, with one dog. So it's, you know, some dogs can handle that. A lot of dogs can, it depends on what you want out of your dog. You know, I mean, usually, most dogs can give you a good, you know, I mean, at the optimum range, you know, hour, hour and a half as far as the pointy dog, yep. then you got to give it a rest. And that's why it's nice to rotate dogs. But, you know, to expect a, a pointy dog to run two, three hours on a, I call it a death march, you know, by the end of that hunt, you know, he's hunting shorter, checking in a lot. And, you know, he's not as enthusiastic. And then when you put him back in the crate, you know, he's, he's spent for a while. So, but with a, a flushing dog, you can get away with some of that because they're not covering the same amount of range that a pointy dog is. So, you know, it's just different styles. and Especially with and, your English pointers. Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the range. You know, I mean, I, I, I train or I keep them a little bit closer to probably people even expect than I do. Sure. And because there's, there's, there's a lot of things that I like, I like once in a while seeing a dog go on point. I mean, that's, that's as exciting as anything. It and is. if your dog's running at 125, 150 yards, it's pretty tough to see that, you know, but if I always say, if they're in that 30 to 90 range, 30, 100 range, you can see a dog go on point, which is pretty exciting. It and is. then, and then it's, then it's much easier for you to get to that point in that range. You know, I mean, um, well, and, and you know, you're, I'm not, I'm not running. I'm not running in the woods and I don't expect anybody I'm with to run. It's just, you know, you're, it's you're, not safe. No. And, and you're up in, you know, pretty heavy cover. So, yeah, you know, there's no reason to have, have the dog run that far out. Um, no. you know, I've, I, I've raised grouse dogs mostly is what we kind of start on. And then we do excursions out to the prairie and, um, my dogs are, I start with the one younger dog starting to actually really pick up some range, which I like because she's a real, she's, she came on really strong and, and, and ha I don't have to correct her at all. Really, mm -hmm. <laughs> It's just yeah. all natural with her. The other dog, you know, she was my first dog. So I don't blame any of it on her. It was all mistakes that I did as a handler, but, um, you know, she, she works a little closer to me cause it's just kind of the trust level that we've developed mm -hmm. and, and right. um, but uh, yeah, it's it it is it it's and even within the dogs, it's amazing to see the same. Uh, I've got two uh, dogs that come from the same parents, uh, just mm -hmm. different litters, and I mean they're completely polar opposites, and mm -hmm. and so that's that's really unique to see. Uh, they both kind of have their strengths, and it's really nice to be able to have a dog or uh, that you can rotate, like you said, because I've been in times where you know I know we're going to be in really thick cover that. My dog that she, my first dog, she wants to run and, and, and I can't, I can't keep up with her in that kind of mm -hmm. cover. And, but I turn her loose out on the prairie and she's a rock star. Um, mm -hmm. And then the little dog excels, you know, and, and Aspen cuts much better. Um, she sneaks around a lot. She doesn't work quite as fast. And yep. uh, I, I, I'm sure you've seen this with your pointers, uh, your English pointers is they run hard and mm -hmm. the, I don't know. I don't know what it is about my my uh, older dog, and it, again, I, it's just probably what how she learned and how I learned to be a dog handler. Um, you know, some mistakes along the way, but uh, she would she if she sees a grouse running on the ground, she can't. She just cannot stop that urge. <laughs> well, that's that's the prey thrive in, in, yeah. in a continental breed. I yep. mean, there's. I mean, it's just what it is, and you know. But you um, throw that bird in grass where she can't see it, and. It, that, yeah. that, that drive to point is it's there and, and she does it in the wood in the grouse woods too. But I, it, it seems like every time we get to the end of the cut, you know, the birds are running and, and, uh, you get to the old, mature stand of woods and she's just like, <sighs> and I'm like, how many did you bump now? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But, well, do you, now do you, do you hunt with a, a bell or a beeper or GPS? What do you hunt with? So that with her, I started with a beeper. And to mm -hmm. be honest with you, I found that the birds, they could hear the beeper. I, I had no doubt in my mind that it affected the way the birds were reacting to the beeper. And so, and it was, the beeper was solely for my um, comfort. I wanted to know where mm -hmm. the dog was. 
Mm -hmm. Um, as I kind of developed as a dog handler and realized that this is only for me, it's not for the dog and it's not for the birds. Um, I had to kind of change my expectations and I, I tried hunting her with a bell, but she didn't really like it. And I've tried, I tried a number of different ways to introduce it to her, but she was a mm-hmm. very sensitive dog to begin with. Um, mm-hmm. it took us a long time to gun break her, uh, just because mm-hmm. I didn't want to push her. And, um, and it all came together fine, but uh, I finally got confidence in her, and I knew that she was kind of over that puppy stage, and I wasn't going to have she wasn't going to run away from me in the woods, or I wasn't going to lose her at, at that point. Mm-hmm. And I went away from it. I don't hunt anything now. I do use mm-hmm. a GPS collar because I find well, Garmin has a really nice remote that I can run two dogs on very easily, and the GPS mm-hmm. feature is nice. And with a younger dog, I had to upgrade the collars, and I said, well. That way I don't have to run a beeper <laughs> mm-hmm. and I can have as a handler, the comfort level that I want to have knowing where my dogs are. Um, I find that a lot of people do things um, for themselves as dog handlers and not mm-hmm. for the dog. And, uh, yeah. and, and that was something I, it, I grew as a dog handler. That was something I had to learn. And um, it, it's kind of a humbling perspective a little bit because you have to go, well, I'm, I can't tell the dog exactly what I want to do and the training's not working. So I have to change my expectations mm-hmm. and, and you have to look in, in internally and, and I don't know, I think that's a tough thing for a lot of people to do stand there in the mirror and go, what have I done wrong and how can I fix it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, and it's nine, nine times out of 10, it's not the dog. <laughs> it's you. Yeah. It was the handler I, I've learned. <laughs> oh yeah. Handler. I get it. I get it. Mm-hmm. So, so anyways, uh, you know, we've got a little bit of a limited time here I, I, with you. I know you've got some stuff coming up this afternoon. So what's going on at the the uh, Rough Grouse Society and American Woodcock Society? What are you guys doing for initiatives coming up here? And, you know, how can we at podcast help? And um, obviously, you know, you guys have memberships and stuff like that. But uh, we, I'd like to hear kind of what you have, have going on here in the upper Midwest. Well, we have a membership drive going on right now. And uh, you know, since we haven't had uh, banquets, you know, for some period of time or fundraisers, that sort of I know I normal. Missed a few. My my good buddy yeah. Jeff and I, we 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 go to a few of them around, and I forget the gentleman who was running them down here in the Twin Cities. But the last we we ended up going over to Fifield, Wisconsin, to that banquet, and he was okay. running it, and he goes, "Not you guys again." <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we spend a little bit of money, I guess, and and uh, we we always tend to get lucky. Right. Well, the, you know, the in-person events, you know, the chapter engagement are, you know, you find out are really important. A lot of it is driven by, you know, memberships, you know, whereas this last year we've had some online uh, events going on, have virtual events and, and uh, raffles and things like that. But they're, they're tough. It, they're, they're tough, especially when, you know, when you're talking about membership. So uh, it looks like, you know, this spring that things are starting to open up and, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and some of our other states ranges, you know, some are going to be sooner than others just because of the states and CDC guidelines. And, uh, sure. but it's really important, you know, as far as the memberships, the membership, you know, drives a lot, you know, our forest initiatives that we, we have on the ground and, and, uh, our forest, uh, <clears throat> um, things that we're doing in Minnesota, we got some really, Great things, you know. We do a lot with the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council, and uh, you know, there's a lot of projects going on there that uh, we're getting ready to sponsor this uh, roving habitat crew, and that no, that's going to be a big no, thing. No, Mark, go ahead. Can you explain to the listeners? Uh, you know, some people that are listening to this might not know exactly who you guys are because this podcast is kind of our our goal is to to reach a bunch of different hunting audiences. Um, and, and, you know, the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society is relatively niche, um, in the industry. So could you maybe just quickly explain to the listeners how your funding works for your organization? Is it solely driven off of, uh, memberships? Well, I mean, it's. And, and, and you know, nonprofit kind of donations. Well, it's, you know, nonprofits, and you know, we're the second oldest conservation group in the United States, which. Again, people don't know. Really? I didn't know that either. Yeah. I, you, you guys are yeah. just as old as the NRA now, almost then, right? Uh, older. You're older than the NRA. Yeah. So so who is the oldest? I'm not sure. Ducks, I thought the NRA Ducks was. Ducks Unlimited. 
no, that's okay. unlimited. Okay. Well, yeah, they're we've the been oldest uh, civil rights organization, I think, is what right. they take yeah. to. But you're but a conservation group. We're, you're, you know, this okay. is our 60th anniversary this year. 60 years. I did see that in, in the membership drive stuff. So, yeah, so we're older than TF and Delta and, and Minnesota Deer Hunters and... You know, the only one that's older us in the Ducks Unlimited and Trout, Trout Unlimited, I think, was close to us at the same time. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, so we, we've been around a long time, and uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, misnomer. We, you know, at one time I saw a thing in Minnesota that there was 18,000 uh, people that said they hunted grouse in uh, Minnesota. But you know our membership in Minnesota was a couple thousand. Sure. And that 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 kind of falls in line with PF, you know, pheasant hunters and how many. But it, you know, I always look to myself: what is it that we're not doing for them I, that they don't understand who we are? And it's you know, and I but again, you know, in, in today's age, awareness it, that really, well, you know, it, but see, it, see, in today's age, I mean, we're all over everything. You are. You, yeah. And so then it, there is some personal responsibility that you you have to take as a, you know, an upland bird hunter that you can't say, you know, I don't know who they are. You have to know who we are. You have to know who the growth because you know, if you're, you're, you're on Facebook, you're in any magazine, any publication, Instagram, we're all over it. So to say that you don't know who we are, then then you're disconnected of reality. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's kind of why I started all of this myself, because I've been very privileged my life through my life to be able to try a bunch of different things. And I fell in love with the uplands hunting and, you know, the, 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 the grasslands and the, the big woods. And I just have an overwhelming sense of, I, the, the, I need to give something back. And mm -hmm. you guys are, are so important to sustaining healthy forest practices and you offer so much to the hunter. When you look at upland hunting, it's mostly done on public land or managed forest land. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a public land sport and it's so important for advocacy, advocacy groups like you to uh, be out there. And, and because for me, What's my legacy in the world? How I, I, I personally have stepkids. I don't have any kids of my own. And I want to make sure that the people that come up in the next generations are going to have the same kind of opportunities that I had to do this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where you guys kind of come in. And that's where I think that disconnect um, between your memberships draw, um, and, and, and the hunters out there, it, it's really that personal responsibility on the hunters to wake up and realize that we got to do something here because at some point, maybe you don't do anything with the rough grouse society. You do something with trouts unlimited, but at some point they're going to come after, you know, the opportunities you have to do what you love. And without well, the support from all of these groups, we don't, we can't continue to do what we do. Well, you know, I mean, if, you know, if you pheasant hunt, you know, you, you join PF, you know, if you duck hunt, you join Delta or DU, you know, if you deer hunt, you jo join, Minnesota deer hunters, quality deer. Man. I mean, if you do something, you should support it because exactly. you're only talking. You know, you're you're talking thirty five dollars. You're talking, you know, uh, uh, a, a night at the bar. You know, so can you give up one night at the bar to support something that you enjoy? And it's amazing that the people that don't join something they're the first ones to complain that you know there's no birds. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, uh, there's no birds. You know, and and. There's too much ATV traffic or, you know, walking trails aren't mowed or, you know, I saw too many out of town cars, you know, all, all this stuff. And then you say, oh, were you a member? You support it? Nope. I was like, okay. You know, and that's, what's really interesting about this is, so you always want to, you know, support something that you really truly love. I mean, you know, our goal is, is, and our mission is, you know, we want to foster a diverse forest ecosystems that, provide homes for wildlife and opportunities and for people to experience them. I mean, it's the, these same forests, you know, clean the air, filter water and support our local community. So, I mean, it, it all goes hand in hand and around. The, and the connection between the forest and the hunter is there and you guys help advocate for that. And that connection has to be exploited 
if you want to enjoy this long term. I, I, I oh. just I, I'm sold on it, but you know it, it, it's it's I don't to me I kind of wonder as well why there isn't more. And I, I mean, our yeah. membership's growing for you guys. Are you seeing year over year membership well, growth? Or? Well, we we, we kind of go up and down. And, Do you? you know, my my personal opinion, which might not be opinion of everybody's, but you know, it, it, let's just take uh, well, we could take. Minnesota and Wisconsin, those are two states here. Whatever you do in those states, you have to buy a stamp. Yep. You know, so there's some value or something added to that thing. But if you do grouse hunting or woodcock, you don't have to buy a stamp. No. And so so people to me personally, I think people think there's no value. It's one of those things that they do. Um, you know, there's no value to it, so I don't have to buy a stamp. And then you know, and, and if you would ask them to buy a stamp, they say, well, I qu- I'm, I'm not going to buy a stamp of grouse. Uh, you know, woodcock is a different story, but I'm not going to buy a grouse. You know, why would I buy a stamp of grouse? So that that activity should be free versus everything else, you know, you should buy a stamp for. I, 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 I can't understand that, but that's that's where we're at right now. And that's why it's important, you know, to, you know, pick up a membership and. And I always tell everybody, you know, if you're a supporter and then you have a friend that's not buy a membership, I mean, $35, you know, it's an easy Christmas gift. It's an easy birthday gift. And so it's, it's one of those things that's, it's grassroots, but you know, like well, you, you guys say, get couple... some good merch on your website and stuff too. I mean, go yeah. buy a hat for the, for a friend. I, I know my, my buddy that holds a grouse camp this year, I think he bought a dozen hats from you guys and he, he had a hat uh-huh. for everybody at camp this year. And so, you know, it's, it's those little things that help support you guys and help really support all the opportunity that we do. Have oh, you here. bet. You know, and we also, we also have uh, uh, staff that works with private land o- owners. And so, you know, it, it, they go hand in hand, you know, our emphasis is on public, but also private is, is also key because there's a lot of, you know, 80 acres, you know, 120, 140. Well, got, there's a lot of small tracks I've that can some, do you, some. I've got a little it, smaller track of land. I might need one of your uh, forestry guys to come out but, and take a look at. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you don't need, big tracks to make an impact and that's what's really important you know i mean grouse are you know exciting you know woodcock you know how they navigate and migrate you don't you you can attract a lot of woodcock with just certain types of uh um, cutting or clear cutting and checkboard a lot of different things are going on but yeah we have some great staff that uh, can consult and help you and get you in the right direction um you know to me that's that's really exciting and i've seen some just fantastic things come out of come out of that yeah you know moving forward with our foresters the fifield uh banquet we my friend jeff and i sat across from uh one of the the forestry guys he was a younger guy and Uh a super bright guy and really enjoyed our our dinner that night talking with him and uh yeah those those types of services too you know it's it's not something I, i guess that a lot of people know about and i happened to stumble into it because i i talked to the one of the gentlemen that handled our area and Mm -hmm. um, I I didn't even realize up until that point that you guys did work hand in hand with private landowners. Oh, well, I, and you know, and I can say there's, there's so much that's going on in, in the States and, and, you know, you can go to our website and we got some things coming out where we have uh, it's called the bellwether bulletin from our CEO and president, uh, Dr. Ben Jones, he puts out and, there's also some things, you know, there's a little tidbit from each forester, go, what's going on in Minnesota, what's going on in uh, Wisconsin and, and throughout the states. And and uh, we got some, you know, to me, it's it's really exciting when you actually, you know, get in there and start reading. And, and even you know, to this day, I always say, I didn't know that. But this is going, I mean, because, you know, we we get involved in the job that we're doing and, and, and not, you know, there's a bigger picture. There's a lot of things going on, just like when this COVID, you know, shut everything down and we were working remotely from home, our forester, you know, he's out marking trees, you know, the, the habitat work didn't change during COVID. All the, you know, all those projects, all the harvesting, all the, everything was continuing. It not, that part didn't stop, you know, and, and then, you know, with included that, the bills didn't stop, you know, all that didn't stop just because, you know, we weren't working in the field or having fundraisers, all the habitat work was continuing. And uh, that was, you know, to me, was exciting. So, um, you know, and I've seen some things down where you're hunting, uh, you know, there's some great cuts down there that are in the next year or two years are just going to be crazy. Oh, there's, and, there's uh, a ton of them. 
you know, but, you know, but you go, you go a little in between kind of, I think where you, you are and I am into the national forest area and you know, it's a little limited for cuts. I'm not going to yeah. lie that they, they don't cut yep. in the national forest nearly, uh, I think enough, at least up, well, up in Northern Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's what, uh, John Steigerwald, who's our, uh, forester, um, for our GS, that's what he's working on. And, you know, John's doing a great, uh, just a fantastic job for us. And it's, uh, you know, we're lucky to have him. He's just, uh, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a good man. Yeah. I did hear, I can't remember where I did hear, I heard it. But I, I did hear that they were kind of planning on starting to do more cuts in some of the national forests up here, which was exciting when mm-hmm. I heard that. Yeah. Uh, it but, just, it, it just takes a, you know, the national forests take a little bit longer than sometimes the county and sure. uh, county seems to be a little bit more aggressive. And, you know, again, that's, you know, for different reasons, but uh, I tend to you know, like the national forest as a grouse hunter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like, you know, I like tax forfeited land if you can find it because <laughs> it has a lot, it usually has a lot of openings, which is, you know, good for grouse and woodcock. So when you find tax forfeited land, that's, some pretty good stuff to hunt. Too. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to put that there. one on my notepad over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the old school, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if that shows up on the Onyx, you know, but the old plot books in Wisconsin, you can buy and uh, they all have the tax for land marked on there. And I've had some nice hunts. <laughs> yeah. You know, we used to buy those things every year every mm-hmm. year and i forget where i um I call yeah, one of the have... counties i used to I, I grew up over by appleton wisconsin and okay it was either like uh, i think it was like Walpaca county maybe i called and she said well you know everything's online now you don't need the i go yeah well <laughs> i like the book because half your county doesn't have well, cell, cell phone you know <laughs> well i i don't want to say my age but i i i love you know i mean i have the onyx and and the Northwind maps, but I still love a plot book and I still like an atlas and I still like the newspaper. You know, um, it's, it's much more fun looking at it than flipping through your screen on your phone. There's no phone big enough to get me that excited about looking at maps. I'm sorry. I, I'm, Whereas, I'm looking at my stack here at Gaz, Gazetteer, yeah, uh, yeah. books it's from just, North Dakota. It's just South more fun. It's, yeah. I love it's it. It's just more fun. Yeah. And, you know, again, you know, back, you know, when we were talking about how you, hunt you know versus the bell beeper gps you know i i'm i'm not a tv guy you know i mean i got i have a gps and i put it on my dog for safety reasons you know i put it on turn it off mark the truck and then um i i don't look at it the whole hunt you know and when i get back to the car and then i clean it out and see how much uh, that dog moved and how much it ran and then on the next one that's that's my how i look at the screen i don't I don't look at it because I, I have other issues. You know, I, I don't walk around holding a screen or, you know, and I don't have the option of looking at my watch. I just, I follow the dog, follow the habitat and let's go have some fun. That's how I am. Honestly, I, it, I, I wouldn't, the GPS is like, if I didn't come home with one of my dogs, my, oh, yeah, my exactly. wife would hang me. So you well, know, that's, it's safety. Exactly. It's safety. Exactly. I did lose one of my dogs as we were in one spring we were out running and I think she finally found some woodcock and I wasn't really, um, that wasn't the purpose of the walk. We were just out walking. Uh, She took Uh off and I mean, by the time I realized I was down one dog, I, I, I didn't know where I lost her. And, you know, it was 10, 15 minutes of kind of losing the heart dropping out of your, you know, your pants. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and I, 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 I had a, actually a dog uh, handler that I know uh, in Western Wisconsin, he raises pointers and uh, mm-hmm. he, he says, Oh, I got, you know, an extra Garmin um, elf or whatever it is. And, and he goes, I'll give you a deal. I, uh, he gave me a deal. I couldn't pass up and mm-hmm. I went forward with it, but I, yeah, I marked the truck and I go and I use it for, I use the top three buttons to control the dogs if they need it. And to be yep. honest with you, most of the time I don't ever touch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, I mean, I've done it. It is interesting and... to see too, the, the dog stats. I, I was about halfway through the season. I found that feature. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, I, I always say, you know, if a dog, if a dog runs six miles and then you walk about two, two and a half and a, and a flushing dog is, 
two to three yep. miles, whereas a pointer dog is about six. And that, and that pretty much true throughout the whole year, you know, time wise, you know. And so that's, I mean, I like that. And that consistently stays true throughout, you know. And, you know, and it doesn't really matter to me how fast a dog runs through the woods, because again, that's, that's irrelevant, you know, it's yep. context. And, and so you have a pointing dog versus a flushing dog, you know, if you have a dog that runs, it puts in six miles in an hour and your dog that puts in um, two miles in an hour. So I, I, that means I just have a more of an opportunity for more bird contacts. That's all. Yep. I mean, you know, so I got four more miles of bird contacts than you do now, you know, and, but there's some, you know, you understand I start with a flushing dog. So it, it, it's how you hunt, but you know, I always like playing the odds. You know, I like, I like the odds, you know, do I increase my odds? Yeah, I increase my odds, but is that, does it make me better? Probably not. I don't know, but it's just what, what you like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, the way I kind of look at it, I keep, and this is my justification for wanting a point, uh, an English pointer, uh, coming from a short hair. Um, you know, I, I go down to Kansas every year a couple times, but one of the trips mm -hmm. I go with, uh, a good friend of mine got kind of linked up with a gentleman that has, um, access to thousands of acres of private land it's just kind of we drive north of town and take a right and it's anywhere anywhere we go we, you know we can go and it's a super fun trip but you know the the guy's 86 years old and so uh, he's been around a lot and you know mm -hmm. he, and so i always enjoy i enjoy hunting with him because the hunting's great <laughs> eight nine mm -hmm. puppies of quail a day i mean it's so way better than most people do on on, on like walk in and, and so we're we're super happy to have awesome hunting but sitting down with them at the end of the day is a, always the greatest because you hear all the stories and, <laughs> and, and, and he has i feel lucky because he, he really likes my dogs but you know he keep, he tells me all this, these stories every year about uh, his english pointers and he goes he goes yeah he goes well you know i, I love all dogs but i wanted a dog that was going to cover a 40 for me. So I get, get out of the truck, let him out. He'd cover the 40 and then tell me where the birds were. And like you said, I like playing the odds and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just kind of funny how, uh, just people look at things like, and, and, and that's kind of how I, I, I'm, I like playing the odds. I like the dog that run, um, covers the ground for me instead yeah. of me necessarily having to go cover all that ground because your likelihood of having more bird contacts, I think goes up as well. Well, hitting objectives, you know, and, yep. and that's, you know, that's always important, you know, hitting objectives and, you know, that's, that's in dog work and that's in habitat work. That's in everything we do is this, you know, hitting, you know, having, um, having goals and hitting objectives, you know, with everything. Well, Hey Mark, I know you've got some time. Uh, you've got a hard stop coming up here. Um, you got any plans for the fall? Are you going anywhere well, fun or are you going to stick well, in the grouse woods? Well, you know, I look at it this way, and, and I'll just talk the Great Lakes states, you know, from basically September 15th to November 1st. Why would you want to be anywhere else? You, you know, know I, I, the only place I, I would like to start my bird hunting season in like Montana, September 1. And then, well, yeah, and then yeah, come back I, here September fifteenth. Well, exactly, but you know, <laughs> but from the fifteenth to November first, I, I don't travel. I don't because either. there's no reason to, and because I mean, we live in a great area, and why would I, you know, want to go chase another species of bird? That that other species of bird will be there, whereas, you know, the grouse will be there. But you know, we've had snow second week in November that you know we're done with the season sometimes. Yep, and woodcock, you know. Woodcock's done usually the first week of uh, November, yep. so I, I like sticking around. So when I travel, I try to travel in September, and I've taken trips to uh, um, before. I've taken to South Dakota, North Dakota. I've been to Oklahoma. I've been all over at different times, and sure, I'm I'm, hey, I'm hoping to take a trip to Kansas this year. Uh, that'll probably be in November, a Kansas trip in November, maybe. Do you uh, and uh, do you have a connection down there, or? I, I I have a couple, but I haven't used them in a long time, and they've been bugging me uh, to go. And so um, this might be the year to go. And I've had some people uh, invite me to uh, Montana in uh, in September for sharp tail, and if my schedule will allow, I might I might go out there with them for three or four days. Nice. But uh, 
but yeah, I, I mean, I really don't do too much travel until November 1st. And then I like November, December, then I'll start chasing some uh, quails. My, I like quail a lot and then pheasants. And then, uh, yeah, it just kind of depends. I, I like quail hunting and, and I grew up in Nebraska, quail hunting and pheasant hunting, pheasant more than quail, but I, I like quail a lot more than I like pheasant. And, but I love them both, but you know, if I had my option i would just do quail I, i'm but, i'm with you i'm 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 a complete addict with it if it has wings and my dog can point yeah. at it I, I love hunting it but um i'm with you i i i found bob white quail um for the first time about six years ago and ever mm-hmm. since then it's 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 the part of the season i just look forward to because that cover well, is so different from coming from you know the grouse woods oh it's just uh I don't know. I, well, I, I use a side by side and I, mm-hmm. it always seems to hit me where I, I, I covey rise. I take one shot, shoot a second shot. And then the rest of the covey gets up. Well, I have two shells in my hand. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, to me, the first, the first covey rise is, you know, I pretty much air wash everything, you know, because, <laughs> and, and then, and then, you know, it's, I don't know how many years it's happened, you know, and then after that, then I settle down and I'm fine. And I just pick off, you know, I concentrate on one and one bird. usually on a, on a cubby rise, I'm happy. You know, once in a while I'll get a double, but I'm not, I really don't care. I concentrate on a single bird yep. and mark it, you know, single bird and mark it, oh, you know. And that marking and, part is so important with those quail. And, uh, you know, I have uh, the pointers that I've had are really strong uh, retrievers and good hunt dead. And so they retrieve and come to hand. And uh, and then now with I have this, uh, these English cockers and last year the the oldest one she went on her first quail hunt and uh and i'm she did a nice job retrieving so i'm i'm you know have like i said i have the best of both worlds right now and we'll see if it if it uh, continues that way <laughs> if it continues that. that was my plan that's my plan you know always have a plan you got to have a plan yeah the plan uh-huh. may get rewritten as time goes on but it, at least you got the plan <laughs> correct it defines where you're headed <laughs> correct well outstanding outstanding yeah I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to do this, some prairie grouse uh for the mm-hmm. opener and and i actually drew a, a black bear tag this year in wisconsin so okay i i kind of had a wrench thrown in a little bit of my early grouse season this year, but uh, luckily there's uh, a lot of grouse cover around where we'll be black bear hunting. So uh, oh, nice. I'll probably be able to do that in the morning and then and bear hunt in the evening. So mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's coming together. I just wasn't expecting the bear tag so early. I, well, I didn't think I had not, enough points. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, and, and you know, it's, it's, you don't get it all the time. And so, you definitely have to uh, take advantage of that. You can't let that go to waste. Well, and and there, yeah, there is definitely a responsibility as well as uh, where we do hunt the landowners. That we have, for some reason, we're in the very southern part of Zone D, the old Zone D, and they're just overrun with black bears. And and so mm-hmm. there's a somewhat of the responsibility there to to limit the number of black bears in the area because there's nobody else really hunting them. So right, it's it's like oh, I got to do this. But yeah. I don't have to, but I I really should. Well, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, I mean, you know, you, you, you know, you put in for your thing, you got the points, they gave it to you. So, yeah, you just, you know, again, you know, you don't have to be 24-7, but I would say, you know, it's an opportunity and try, try and give it a yeoman's chance and, you know, do the best you can. And then, you know, when bird, bird season happens, you, you got to go bird hunt. I just wanted to spend more time, and then I think I'm going to be able to out in uh, Montana. I, well, I've, I've never been bird hunting in Montana, and they, okay. no, they they keep telling me if you want to you want to raise a real good dog, you got to go to Montana. <laughs> well, uh, hey, just remember, life is short and bird season shorter. Exactly. So. <laughs> Whatever excuse you use to justify, but yeah, it, it's, that's right. It's it's, uh, it's only. But, but, you know, I've found, too, is something I ha- I don't know if you've ever done. Have you ever hunted down uh, the qu- a desert quail? I haven't. I have friends that go down there in uh, January and February. But usually, uh, I used to spend time in January down in Louisiana chasing woodcock. Oh, and, sure. Uh, so uh, I I would rather chase woodcock in January than chase desert quail. Now, it doesn't mean anything wrong with desert quail, but I, I like woodcock in January in Louisiana. 
So that's where that's where I that's my goal is to be there as much as possible. Well, we might uh, we might have to have you back on the podcast here to talk specifically <laughs> about that because uh, I, my folks have all migrated south now and they're uh-huh. snowbirds and I'm I'm getting a little tired of January and February up here and uh-huh. I know my dogs are too so we're looking for places to extend our season and and get out of the snow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very I, I, I think I, I've never heard anybody talk about uh, woodcock hunting down in Louisiana. So. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's 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 just the best. The people are just incredible, and, and the food is probably even better. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a triple threat down there. You know, people, food, and woodcock. All three of them. You can't you can't go wrong. Oh, that that sounds very interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. So yeah, I, I know you got I a love... hard stop here. Oh, okay. I, I, no, I go ahead. I I apologize. No, I'm just gonna say I, I appreciate you uh, giving me an opportunity and. Uh, I uh, appreciate coming on your podcast and wish you the best. Oh, I, I, I really thank you, Mark, for, for this. And, and, you know, we had gotten linked up a little bit through youth mentor, your youth mentor program. Mm-hmm. We didn't even really get a chance to talk about it today. Next show. Next show. Yeah. We'd love to have you on again to talk about that too, because, um, you know, I, I want to definitely be part of that this fall. So, uh, okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time for us today. And, and, uh, we'll, uh, definitely stay in touch and, and try to get you on here soon again. Thank you, Brian. All right. You have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Bye now.